Hi, everybody. Oh. Welcome. We're going to get started. So I'm going to kick things off and just introduce everybody. Uh, my name is Lainey. Welcome to levering, leveling up your user research skills when you're a student. So working with local devs and more. So we're going to have a little bit of a panel. We'll have a bunch of time for question and answer later. Just want to give you guys a heads up that we do have quite a few slides with a lot of information packed on them. It's intended that you can stop and take pictures. We're going to be pausing for quite a while. Don't try and write everything down to snap a picture. We also are going to be able to send slides afterwards so we can send you the PDF as well if you're interested in getting the whole packet of information so you're not trying to like scribble everything. Okay. So. All right, I'll introduce the panelists. First, my name's Lainey, not really important. I'm gonna talk mostly about them, so <laughs> let's kick it over to them. So we have Jess Tompkins, a user research analyst at Bethesda Softworks. We have Hannah Murphy, she's the UX lab analyst at Epic Games. And on the end, Bree Stevenson, games user researcher at Player Research. So let's jump right in. I want you guys to talk a little bit about what you did before industry. Sure. Um, so on the panel, I've been in school the longest. I mean, I'm no longer in school, um, but I got a master's in media arts, um, still currently pursuing a PhD in media arts and sciences while working full time in the games industry. Um, I'm what is called ABD, all but dissertation. So done with coursework, done with exams, just writing the dissertation in my abundance of free time that I have. <laughs> um, so managing to make that work somehow, um, but you know, kind of chose the path to take a job in industry while uh, finishing up the PhD part time. Um, in my past, I've also um, worked with students on my at my university, which is Indiana University, uh, leading a women in game design special interest group. So, kind of being an advocate for women in game design and just organizing and running workshops for women interested in game dev. Um, so, and, and while I was in grad school, I did focus primarily on social scientific research. Um, in a media school, um, but I chose to focus on video games pretty much exclusively. And where I got my sort of um, informal education in games user research was when I was collaborating with game development students at my university and sort of being a consultant um, in terms of doing usability feedback for them, helping them ask good questions if they were running their own play tests and so on and so forth. I'm Hannah Murphy. I was at US Bank prior to my role at Epic Games as a UX researcher. Uh, I have a master's in mass communication, uh, so a lot of social psychological research there with video games and gender. Um, I, similar to Jess, collaborated with people in my local community to get experience doing games user research, but instead of students, I would collaborate with local independent developers. Um, I would uh, collaborate occasionally, though, with the university where I got my master's uh, to get participants and work with them on using their, uh, their uh, classes as participant pools to get um, participants for my research. Hi, I'm Brianne Stevenson. Um, I am currently a player research and I have a mouthful of a degree name. Um, <laughs> so I graduated from the undergraduate uh, IT program at UOIT in Oshawa, Ontario, and it is the Bachelor's of Information Technology majoring in video game development and entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's a wonderful mouth, uh, mouthful. Um, so during my time at the university, I collaborated on yearly projects with game development students, as that was the structure of our program. So I got to help with user research on individual small teams of five to seven. Um, as well, during my undergraduate, I worked as a UX researcher under professor there, and I helped working on uh, outsourced projects. I worked with a small indie development team uh, and helped do competitor analysis for them there. Great. I think it's really cool that you guys kind of all have these different kind of educational backgrounds. Obviously, you've all kind of done different things, but it all kind of comes down to you've collaborated with kind of people that were readily available to you when you were in school, whether it was people on campus or kind of indies. So that's a kind of a really interesting thing, kind of how you what you did before then. So let's talk a little bit more about like how you guys actually got your first user research job. Sure. Um, so this is this slide here just sort of pre provides the outline of our talk. When we were sort of organizing this panel, the three of us got together and just talked. What, you know, kind of asked ourselves, what did we do to sort of 
end up sort of getting our first uh, positions in this field. And these are sort of things that we all actively did, and we feel that they contributed strongly to us um, getting games, uh, getting jobs at AAA or game companies, or you know, um, one of the one of the more sort of uh, premier uh, companies um, doing player research consultancy. So uh, we all networked. We all came to events like this. Uh, we met people. Uh, we joined the online communities like the Discord that's out there. Um, we we just kind of let like introduce ourselves to people and, and networked. So the fact that you're here is a really great start. Mm -hmm. uh, we sought playtest and research experience. Uh, we all had a sort of our own pathways into doing this. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, later on in, in the talk. Uh, but these were the sort of the, the key skills that we developed. And along the way, as we were doing playtest and doing research, we developed our you know sort of methods and tools um, conducting social science research. Uh, we also had to overcome some misconceptions. So as a student or a junior, you may have like all of these uncertainties, all these questions, and uh, we wanna share those with you today and we will. Um, so um, you may find out that you actually have some misconceptions about breaking into GER. And we consulted some resources and we have um, a couple slides for the end that are absolutely jam packed with information, links, uh, resources, et cetera. So we'll, we'll share all of those with you today. All right, so as Jess was saying, we all networked in some way. So being here is a great step to getting a job in games user research. Uh, I would say it's absolutely essential to come here. It has helped all three of us so much just by being here uh, and being here for years at that, not just coming here once and landing a job. Um, that might be a, a misconception people might have is that it's uh, easier than it actually is. Um, but showing up here is a great first step. Um, using Twitter as a tool. The games user research community is really active on Twitter and um, just checking out conversations, trying to get involved and have your voice heard on Twitter is really good. Uh, the Grux mentoring program, uh, I've used that myself uh, with Kevin Keeker, <clears throat> if any of you know him, but that's a great tool. If the waiting list isn't too terribly long, I suggest getting on that, trying to get there. And if it is too long and it's like months out, Oh, you can meet people here. Um, I know even though I've been part of the Grux mentoring program, I've also kind of just networked here and talked to people and have um, informal mentors that way. And I go to on an as needed basis if I'm working on a project. Um, and then uh, the Games UR Summit and GDC is also very helpful. Uh, I partook in a power leveling program through Glitch uh, that's run by Nicholas Van Muren back there and his wife, Ava. Uh, that has been super helpful. Um, you're basically paired with, with a mentor for the week, and they help you kind of navigate uh, this mess <laughs> of figuring everything out um, for newer people. And I'll open it up to Jess and Brianna about their own experiences with networking. Yeah, so um, I'm from Canada. I'm from, uh, I'm living in Montreal, but I'm from Ontario originally. And I came to the GER Summit when I was in my fourth year of my undergraduate, and I can say it is one of the best decisions I made, even though it hurt a little in the pocketbooks to come here. But it was one of the best decisions. I made some of the best contacts and honestly friends here, and it's amazing that you guys are here now. Um, yeah, my experience was very similar to Hannah's. I came to GDC on uh, a scholarship my first time in 2017. Uh, and we actually have in our resources slide some links to where you can find out more about scholarships. Um, so it, it can be very expensive, unfortunately, but if you are able to go, um, obviously the GER Summit is the most important community that you can network with while you're here, but it can, GD, being at GDC can also be useful to meet people who are like in adjacent fields or just in the, you know, talking to people who work at the companies that you're interested in. Um, those can all be really useful. Um, and with the GDC pass, you can go to one of the round tables that are usually held on Friday. I believe there's one this Friday mm -hmm. um, in the afternoon. So if you do happen to have a pass, um, that's a great space where you can be in a, a smaller room and just talk to people and introduce yourselves after afterwards. Well, I think it's great. It's a nice kind of well-rounded kind of group of different resources, whether it's virtual or in person. So I think it's kind of a nice wrap up of different networking opportunities that you can have. 
So let's discuss a little bit more about, um, I think this kind of question comes up a lot about kind of what skills did you hone when you were kind of getting started before you got into your first job? Sure. And, and this uh, playtesting experience is kind of like at the forefront of our talk. Like the title is leveling up your user research skills, working with local devs and more. Um, unfortunately, like we have so much stuff we want to cover. We have one slide dedicated to this because there's a lot more of the and more part of the talk that we want to cover as well. Um, but playtesting experience, I don't, I think we can't stress it enough. It's one of the most vital things, uh, one of the most vital skills you can learn while you're still a student um, or in a, um, before you're landing your first entry level job. Um, I was able to, um, I was pretty fortunate because I was in a media school that had a game design program. There were a ton of undergrad students who were working on games, working on projects constantly. Um, so I always had a pool of people that I could reach out to and just be like, hey, you're working on this project. It's still early in development. I have this experience doing research. Um, are you interested in having me work with you and provide some feedback on your game? Um, and the students were, you know, sometimes a little resistant to it. They didn't quite understand, you know, why do I need a researcher? I'm a designer. I have all of these ideas. Of course, my ideas are going to be great. You know, these are, these are passionate students who are working on their first projects, like their, their senior year capstone project. So, um, when you are reaching out, especially to students, it does take time to earn trust. Um, in addition to there being like a game design program at my university, there was a uh, student organization that was just a group of students who would get together regardless of major. You know, we had people in like the business school who would come to the student game dev club and make games. Um, so I would also go to that group, uh, work on game projects. I'm not, you know, formally trained as a game designer, but I dabbled in it and I worked on projects with students just to get to know them better. And I'd show up at their other sort of meetups as well. Um, and by sort of kind of developing that trust over time, students were a little more um, accepting of like, yeah, maybe this research thing is a good idea. Maybe having someone on board to give feedback who has this expertise is a good idea. Um, so I found that that was very useful because I was able to write up sort of like usability reviews or give feedback on survey questions that the students were going to use in their own play tests. And I was able to, um, kind of keep a record of all that, all that work I was doing, whether it was a usability review or, um, a play test of sorts, I would put that online on my personal blog and sort of have like, uh, not a, f a super formal portfolio because portfolios aren't really standard in our field, but um, it became like an archive of the work that I had been doing while in school. And Hannah and I co-authored a blog post. It's on Gama Sutra and Medium. Uh, we talk in depth in this blog post about like best practices for working with student and indie devs. Um, and th there's the short URL to it. So we encourage you all to take a look because it goes really in depth, uh, more so than we can actually do uh, in the constraints of this talk. Um, but Hannah may want to chime in as well because she worked with indie devs. So Yeah, so very similar uh, skills I honed to Jess. Um, working with indie devs is very similar to, I guess, in the sense that you're working with people who may not work with researchers, so like students may not. So there's a lot of teaching them as much as you're learning yourself about what research has to offer. Um, and that's great experience because once you get into the industry, um, being able to kind of I don't know if defend is the right word, research, um, but I guess for lack of a better word, defend why research is valuable is a really useful skill to have in and of itself. Um, so yeah. Uh, I had a similar uh, experience as well. Although with the devs that I worked with, um, they came to us looking for research. So I luckily had that a little bit easier because they were already interested in having research. Um, but with students themselves, some of them were a little bit unsure of what GER was. They didn't know if they needed it. They didn't know if they even wanted it. Um, and when you're, because of the way my program was made, um, we were in a group with it. So it was, it was kind of like, I'm doing research for you guys. And now I need to figure out a way to make you realize that that research is useful. And I'm not trying to tear down your ideas. I'm trying to help us all make a better game. Great. So you think it's Obviously, playtesting experience is very important, and I know you guys said you go into a little bit more detail of best practices, so I think it's probably a good idea to check those out if you have questions more specifically about how that goes. 
So you talk a lot about playtesting experience, but let's talk a little bit more about the actual kind of more general research experience, kind of how you honed those skills. Yeah, so um, this slide overall, it just comes down to communication. All of these points can be summarized with communication. And whether that be selling yourself, selling GER, or talking to devs, or even talking to participants, it's all about communication, and communication is key. Um, so you need to be able to explain what GER is and why GER is important. We, we've said this already in the talk, but being able to communicate that no, you're not trying to tear down their game. No, you're not trying to tell them that their ideas are wrong. You're trying to help grow what they have there. You're trying to make it better. Um, and with that comes working with participants. You want to make sure that you can get the information you want out of your participants without skewing what they have to say. You want to ask the questions in a way that you get what you want, but you haven't led them to the answer. Um, and all of these things help to make it so that you can be better equipped to enter the industry. Yeah, I can't stress how uh, key communication is. I just want to reiterate that because <laughs> that is super key. Um, really, in research in any field, that's key. Being able to communicate and understand the needs of your stakeholders because you'll be working with a variety of stakeholders and being able to understand that and communicate what you're doing for them and how that helps them is so, so, so important. And sometimes you're not even going to be contacting them in verbal. You'll be having a report and being able to create an actionable, understandable and readable report that they will look at and say, yeah, we can do this. This is going to be awesome for our game. That's a really important skill to have. Yeah, another thing that I wanted to add about research experience is, um, you know, this is kind of research outside. It can be research outside of playtesting or traditional like usability research. Um, I came from a graduate research program that was not like applied usability research. Uh, I was in a media school where a lot of faculty and students were just studying general media effects from a psychological perspective and using social scientific methods. So even if you end up in a graduate program that isn't HCI or informatics or ergonomics focused, you can still get into research uh, by working with faculty, collaborating with other grad students. Again, this is more at the graduate student level. If you're undergrad, there are also sometimes opportunities to uh, work with faculty on research projects, though it is more competitive and less common, I imagine. Uh, but uh, getting re you can still get research experience outside of playtesting um, by, work by working with faculty or other grad students on just more general like social scientific research projects because what's really important from that experience is the skills and the working with human participants um, that is transferable to working professionally in games user research. Absolutely. I think that's a really great point is that that even if you're not necessarily working on something game specific, it's that kind of overall research experience that can be really transferable. And sometimes we forget that maybe when we're thinking about getting into games and we want to be really focused on that. It's nice to kind of think a little bit outside of the box as well. well. Yeah. And just one other quick note is like when I first started getting into games user research as a grad student who was not, of course, not yet working in industry, I used to have a little minor anxiety. Like I'm not in HCI, I'm not in informatics, I'm not going to be good enough, I'm not going to be knowledgeable en enough. But what was really important was the, res the research skills. Uh, because, you know, whether it's HCI, psychology, media science, it's all social science. Mm -hmm. no, no, I think that's a great point. So I think kind of trying to tie in that playtest experience and the research experience, I think is kind of that nice little package of kind of this whole well-rounded, even if you aren't doing game specific, it's mm -hmm. nice to be able to have the playtesting that kind of supplements maybe some of the academic research and things that you're working on through your coursework. Mm -hmm. So building off of that, let's talk a little bit, cause I know I get this question all the time. I see this question being discussed all the time. What courses did you guys take when you were kind of finishing your bachelor's or master's, your PhD, like what did that look like? Yeah, so all of us took a variety of research methods courses, both qualitative and qualitative in nature. Um, I know personally, I came from a very interdisciplinary program. Um, some programs will be more quant focused, 
Others, others will be more qualitative focused. Mine was very much like, we want you to do everything and be well-rounded and be, be uh, you know, an interdisciplinary unicorn. Um, so I learned, I learned a little bit of both. Uh, I tended in my personal research projects to focus more on quantitative research methods, just because that's what I was drawn to more personally. And then I found out, oh, this also ties really nicely into GER, uh, excuse me, as well. <laughs> Um, but the thing about GER is that it's a mix a bit of, of both qualitative and quantitative. So it is useful to have training in both. Um, with qualitative um, research methods training, you can learn to identify trends in qualitative data, such as interview transcripts, um, so open-ended survey questions as well. Um, it's going to help you to pick up real quick on sort of the key takeaways, you know, extract information out of like a paragraph, what's usable, what's useful, what's insightful. Um, with quantitative research methods, if your university offers a survey design course, I found that is one of the most useful courses I've ever taken as a researcher. Um, if you were here for Elizabeth Zelli's excellent uh, talk on, uh, you know, lessons learned from surveys in the wild, uh, you know, chances are maybe those people who wrote those questions never actually took a survey design course, because I think it really shows. I would, uh, after, like, some of those questions were so bad, like, I, I don't know uh, who wrote them, but um, survey design courses will really open your eyes. Like, you think writing a survey is like a very like, eh, I'm just going to ask a question, have some answers, but it's actually a bit of an art. Um, and you want to write questions that aren't leading, that aren't biasing, um, and, you know, that are inclusive as well, so that you don't uh, marginalize any of your participants. Um, so if you didn't see Elizabeth Zelli's talk, I recommend watching it once it's mm -hmm. up on YouTube. Um, and then I Kind of this also ties into misconceptions is um, your knowledge of stats. So having a good basic knowledge of stats is super useful, but don't feel like you have to be a statistical genius. I'm certainly not. And I took like three or four different stats classes as a grad student. I didn't, I don't remember everything that I was taught. So don't stress if you don't come out of, you know, you're not coming out of grad school as like a master of like, you know, using R and Stata and all these advanced uh, stat programs. Um, if you know one and you know it well, that's usually pretty good. And if you're going to work in usability and engagement, your primarily your primary skill that you're going to be using on the job is qualitative. So um, I have not opened SPSS for my work, <laughs> and I've been in working in industry for nine months now, and I may never open SPSS. So. Yeah, and then also to add on to that, nice to know, but not necessarily essential are things like game design or UX design or other HCI courses. Uh, Jess and I come from a similar academic background. Um, in my master's degree, I just kind of dabbled in a little bit of everything because I had this misconception that I, oh, I'm so far behind, like I have to know all these stats. Uh, I want to take all these advanced, like, you know, quantitative or qualitative research methods. But I feel like um, the things I did take, which are more like intro classes, uh, were definitely like a good starting point for me. And similar to Jess, I also have not opened SPSS <laughs> in a, either of my research jobs. Uh, since graduating. Yeah, I have a uh, different program, different uh, courses in general from both Jess and uh, Hannah, but I, the, what we've covered on the slides generalizes what I did. So I had a very different experience where I actually had a games user research course. I had an HCI for games course. Um, I had three years of game design. Uh, so I had a very different way into the industry. Um, but we did cover quantitative and qualitative. We did cover interviewing. We did cover survey design. Um, and I chose to take a statistics course later on. And I learned Tableau. I haven't opened it since then. I don't even have it on my computer anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a nice kind of array. So it's nice to kind of keep in mind maybe what position you're trying to go into when you're thinking about the courses, whether you're going to be more qualitative focused, thinking about the courses that could be helpful there. If you're going to be going to something more quantitative, thinking maybe stats might be more important. Yeah. But for the average user researcher, maybe advanced level statistics is not necessarily a requirement. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's, we talked a little bit about courses. So what kind of tools do you feel like, did you learn that you feel like you're using now? Maybe you learned, but maybe aren't as useful now. Let's talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this also kind of ties into misconceptions. 
uh, survey tools. So survey tools are really useful to know as a researcher, but you don't necessarily have to know all these survey tools out there. Um, it is fine to know just one and be very good at that. It tends to be that if you know one really well, it's pretty easy to learn other tools as well. So I learned Qualtrics in grad school, and then when I was at US Bank, we used like SurveyMonkey and UserZoom, and then Epic, we used different tools. So it's like if you can learn one of them and learn one of them well, it's really transferable. Um, and then nice to know, again, but not essential, things like Tableau, as Brienne was saying. She hasn't used it since she's learned it. Um, and then, like me and Jess were saying, we haven't really used SPSS at all. Um, if you are wanting to use that, though, uh, there is a free version of a very similar to SPSS called JASP. Uh, I have found it way easier to use than our personal preference. So if you are wanting to learn stats or just kind of familiarize yourself with that, uh, I recommend that tool. And then games engines, uh, again, it's like, if that's really relevant to the job you're trying to get, then yes, of course, you should know uh, game engines. But it's uh, nice to know, but not necessarily on a need to know basis. So I mentioned for my program that I learned Tableau. Um, if any of you have looked at a large amount of Excel data, you realize that that is very difficult to parse. Um, the one advantage with any kind of information visualization tools, like, such as Tableau, is it can make your data a lot more readable. So if you're looking to get into analyst positions or anything with heavy data analyzing, uh, Tableau would be useful to learn. Um, but something that was kind of drilled into me over the years was it's not the tools you learn, it's the transferable skills you get from using those tools. It's being able to write a survey question, being able to understand that if you hand someone a bunch of data on an Excel sheet with a bunch of numbers, they're going to look at that and go, what is this? <laughs> so it's about what you can do with the tool, not necessarily the tool you know. If you know a tool that's similar to something else, it can be transferable. And that's, that shows that you have the skills that are needed. I think that's... that's on point advice for sure. It's it's an important thing to not get so lost and overwhelmed when you're trying to learn everything. It's the it's the skills that are the important bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we keep talking a little about misconceptions. Let's talk about some of them that we have here that you guys have come across since you've gotten your job. Yeah. So uh, as Hannah mentioned, her first job was at US Bank. Um, your first job doesn't have to be in GER. It's not a rush to get into the industry. Take your time take what you need. And you don't necessarily need an advanced degree. If you, the three of us, bachelors, masters, and PhD, you don't need to have a PhD. You don't need to have a master's. It's about the skills you have and what you can do with what you have learned, not necessarily the, the degree you have attached to your name. Do take some time after graduating. Uh, myself, I took, I, I think it was at least two months before applying. I spent the time researching. I took a break from school because taking years and years of school, it's a lot. So take a break, look into what you want to do, learn what you want to do, because there are different things needed for different positions. You might not know exactly what position you want. There are a lot of positions in UX. So see what it is you're interested in before applying. As was just mentioned, you don't need to be a master of statistics. I took a single st statistics course and I haven't really used much of any of it. Um, game engines are nice to know, but not a need to know. Check to see if the position you want needs it. Not all positions will. It might not even be listed on a lot of positions. Um, and finally, this one comes close to me because this is something that I experienced. Um, mentorship and networking doesn't ex extent, bleh, exclusively come from the mentorship program. I didn't get into the mentorship program. I, uh, when I looked, it was full. When I looked again, it was full. It was still closed. Um, but the people who I met, met here have helped me out a huge amount. Last year, I met dozens of super friendly, super nice, very, very helpful people who helped me get to where I am today. The people you can network with, the people that can help mentor you are around you right now. So go out, start a conversation, say hello. We're happy to help. Mm -hmm. I think that's great, especially with the mentorship program. Frequently, 
being full, hopefully not for much longer. <laughs> um, it's, it's nice to think about just actually leveraging the people that are here. I think that's great advice. Yeah. I had one little thing to chime on about the advanced degree. Um, and this just kind of speaks to, you may have a sort of non-traditional path into games user research. And that's basically my story. I got an undergraduate degree in anthropology. Uh, if you also happen to have a degree in anthropology, you may know there's not a whole lot you can do with it with an, a BA in anthropology. So it was when I graduated, it's like, well, I better go to grad school. And I went for a MA in media arts and I dabbled in game dev. Um, and it was, but it was a very broad, like, we want to teach you media skills. And so I learned a lot, but I didn't come out as an expertise in anything. So I stayed in school to learn more skills. And I, I discovered I liked research and that's why I went for the PhD. You might be someone like Brianne who is in a very specialized program and you're learning, you know, GER um, and game design at the undergraduate level. And that's awesome, but not all universities have a program like that. So you may find that you have a somewhat, you know, you're, you're taking different degrees and taking different courses, but you, you can, you can get there. Even if you feel like you're in school forever, like me, you can get there. And take your time. Yes. Seriously, take your time. It's fine. It's not a rush. Do it at the pace that you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to touch on that first bit again um, about how I worked in uh, US, at US Bank before coming here. And I've been coming here now for three years. And I can't stress enough, like, it's totally okay if you don't work in GUR right away. Um, I've met a lot of friends throughout the years that I've been coming here. And I feel like so many of them leave after coming here for one year because they're like, oh, it's harder than I thought it would be. Or like, I, there's no, no way I'll ever get in because it's so competitive. But just don't give up. We all want you to succeed. And please come talk to us and those around you. I think that's great. And it's nice that you guys can feel like you can chat with everybody and share your experience. And that it's just another person that you're available to talk to. So that's great. So we talked a little bit about having the massive resources slides. Mm -hmm. Talk me through some of your kind of preferred, what's some of our favorite kind of resources that are available. Yeah, so mine was absolutely the power leveling uh, scholarship that I used um, with Bradlin to go to GDC a couple <laughs> years ago. Uh, I can't recommend it enough to you. Um, so please come ask myself about it, ask Nick or ask Bradlin. Um, I'd be happy to help you out with that um, and give you advice. Um, otherwise, just coming here, volunteering, uh, trying to help out with the summit in any way you can is amazing. Um, those are probably the two things that I felt were the most helpful for myself. Yeah. And it also you like volunteering gets you a badge just in case that's not clear you can you get here for free uh, if you're volunteering same thing with being a conference associate at gdc uh the application for that is pretty like straightforward you just have to write a short paragraph that says why should you be a conference associate at gdc and you just have to answer that question uh, it's very broad but it's not a lot of work um I actually got accepted as a conference associate and then turned it down because I got a scholarship which was nice um but aside from that, um, the one thing you want to pay attention to with conference associates is that deadline is usually in December. So even though GDC isn't until March or, you know, early February sometimes, you got to have it done by like middle of December. So just go to that website and pay attention to when those deadlines are happening so you can fill it out in time. Good. That's a good point. The mm -hmm. deadline comes through super quick. Yeah. So I know we have another, some more kind of links here you guys yeah. want to point out um take a picture <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> on these slides um so in general this this slide is just work with work with who you can even if that's just general participants in your community uh and familiar familiarize yourself with the GUR resources that are available there's a lot online um the gdc vault the there's you can find all of the GUR talks on the the GUR sig website so if you want to just sit down for an evening and watch them all or watch them over lunch. It's great. Um, as well as uh, the community here is small, but we're really friendly. So mm -hmm. strike up a conversation. I know I've said this already, but just come talk to us. But remember that people here are busy. If you're reaching out by email, give them some time to respond and always be polite. We have a lot of things going on, but we do want to help. Yeah. And when it comes to reaching out, if... Um 
it helps if you can have a very, you know, a very specific question you're asking. Sometimes it can be like, honestly, I've been on the receiving end where people or um, someone asks a question, but it's so broad. It's like, that's going to take me hours to really think through that and answer that. But if you can start a little more specific, like I'm in this program studying these things, do you think there's anything that I could work on to get into games user research? That's really helpful because when I have people reach out and are like, How'd you, how'd you get a, how'd you get a job in GER? Any advice you could pass on? Well, that's just like, there's a lot of things I can tell you, but you, you can to, just send them the link yeah, for the talk. That's yeah. true. <laughs> um, but also, um, it also helps your, the person you're reaching out to, if you can give a little more context on your background and your experience. Mm -hmm. Also, so, yeah. get in touch with us. All the yeah. info is yes, up there. Yes, and yes, I believe, all of our info is up there. I believe we'll all be at the mixer as well. So come say hi. Mm -hmm. We're happy to talk. Awesome. Thank you, guys. We're going to go into question and answer, but I'm going to steal the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually want to start with the very first question. What's something you know now that you wish you had known when first getting into games user research? I can start this one. Um, <laughs> it's okay to not know everything and admit that you don't know everything because we're all like you're juniors. I'm a junior right now. It's okay if you don't know something, just learn as much as you can. There's things that it may feel bad saying to yourself that like, oh shit, I don't know that. But like, it's all learning experience. It's okay. Be honest with yourself, but also be willing to learn. I would say mine is along the lines of methodology. Uh, that I wish I would have known I didn't have to be amazing at statistics. Um, I know that now, but I wish I would have known that. Um, it would have saved me a lot of stress, I feel like, in grad school focusing on that. Definitely, yeah. I think mine is also ties into some of the topics we've already covered. Um, but um, I did probably also spend more time teaching myself game engines than I needed to know, to be honest. Although um, it did end up being somewhat useful because I taught a summer camp teaching like Unreal Engine to young girls. So if you can teach your, if you want to learn game engines, but also find a way to make that like a side hustle, that's actually pretty awesome. You can, you know, <laughs> teach an, uh, teach a course or volunteer your time, like work with an organization like Girls Who Code or Black Girls Code, right? You know, you can, you can pass on those skills. Like if you do want, decide you want to dabble into something like, oh, I'm kind of curious about game engines and the, you know, what goes on behind the scenes in game development. It can be kind of useful to kind of know the constraints in which dev devs are working with. Um, but try, like I would say, like, you know, also find a way to, to do something with it beyond yourself in a way, I guess. Great. Well, we'll open it up for questions, actually. So anyone has, or we can keep going through the list of questions. Bradlin. Thank you. I remember this this time. So when you all were interviewing for your first GER job, and you were talking about kind of the experience you've done so far, like working with university devs or working with indie devs, what are some of the ways you kind of like spun that or kind of like talked to those during your interviews? Like what were the high points you pointed out? I think for me, it was just being able to um, kind of call out that I had worked with students and that I was able to write up some usability feedback. I think at the time they, they did ask me like, what sort of suggestions suggestions did you make? And did they implement any of the suggestions that you gave them and so on and so forth? Uh, that was a little over a year ago now. So it's a little hard for me to extract exactly uh, but I know that it made interviewing a bit easier because I would be, I would, I would get asked about that experience because it was on my resume. I put it on there and they would ask about it. So I think having that as like a topic of conversation was helpful. Yeah, mine was very similar working with indie dev since it was also on my resume and also on my uh, personal website that I had, uh, they would ask me about it and, uh, the focus was more on the process of it and being able to walk through that process and what the end result was. So my interviews were a little more recent since I've only been in the industry for six months. Um, but I believe if I remember correctly, I used it as um, the, the work I'd done in university with, with students, I looked at as being able to work in a team, being able to work with people who didn't necessarily understand GER. 
um, for working with indies, it was more that I was able to work with the client, that I was able to communicate what we were finding and get the information from them and make it into an appropriate study. I did a competitor analysis that was my main experience with uh, indie devs. Um, but it was that I had that experience at all, um, that I was able to work for a client and that they were happy with what came out of it. Um, so really it was, it was the communication between it. It was the experience of doing it and that I had done these things outside of school time as well. Hi, my name is Salem. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, my quick question is that uh, in terms of your showcasing your portfolio, you're going to get some projects that obviously come under NDA. Now, how is the best way you would say to actually say that you worked on a, that project, but not actually say that you worked on that project? So <laughs> I, I <know> it's, it's <laughs> when you are it, working professionally in the industry, no one's going to ask you to show a portfolio that's under NDA. Like that's just something that doesn't happen. Uh, once you're in the industry, if you've worked at it in user research for a, a studio or a company, uh, when you're on the job market or you're applying for jobs, they're just going to see the fact that you were working in user research and be like, okay, then, and then they'll get in touch with you and probably have an interview and then maybe send you like a test of some kind. Um, but they're not going to ask you to show, like, show me the work that you did on a game that was under NDA. They're just not going to ask that. Mm -hmm. So once you're in the games industry, you don't have to worry about that question. Uh, when you're a student and you're working with, uh, you know, when you're working with indie developers or student developers, that's a non-issue. Like you can, you can show them like, here's the reports I wrote up. If you want to see them, like you can, um, like on my resume, I just had a link to my website and on my website I had blog posts and I had uploaded the PDFs for a couple of reports of like usability reviews that I did for, st for student games. So um, I, you can definitely have those documents when you, before you're in industry, but then once you're in industry, like I haven't updated my blog since I've been in the industry. Um, like I don't have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I haven't had an indie dev developer tell me I can't show that um i guess like there is a chance like you always want to ask <laughs> and, and make sure that's okay that you show that um but i haven't had anyone tell me that they're not okay with that uh i actually have the different experience with that the indie developer i worked with during my university career i cannot say what the project was i cannot say who they are um at all i i can't even say what platform it was on that was all signed into the nda what i could say was i've done a competitor analysis on their game, on similar games in their um, uh, genre, um, and that I created reports for them, that I worked closely with them, that kind of thing. So as Jess and Hannah said, uh, people understand within the industry, if you say you're under NDA, it's really, it's the skills you have, it's what you've done while dancing around the NDA, of course. Mm -hmm. but yeah, but consent is obviously a, a very good thing to have yeah. when you're working with any kind of like indie or student mm -hmm. dev, just Get the okay. Yeah. Oh, I think Adams. Adams and yeah. oh, they sit. We're out of oh, time. Oh, we're out of time. Out of time. Oh. oh. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Talk to us. Yes, come talk out to later. us later. Yeah, out there. Thank Ask you so much. Questions. Thanks.